Good morning. Welcome uh, to this early session, presidential session, titled Education, Democracy, and Citizen Justice. I'm Alfredo Artiles from Arizona State University. I'm going to be chairing this session. President Gaston um, asked me to fill in for her. She had some other commitments, unfortunately, so I'm happy to be here. This session is expected to address and engage the theme of the conference, Knowledge to Action, Achieving the Promise of Educational Equity, Educational, Equal Educational Opportunity. And if you remember the theme of the conference, uh, it conveys a sense of urgency about the need to address enduring change to uh, eliminate barriers to opportunity, engagement, and success, especially for students that are marginalized and have had limited opportunities over time. There are a number of very interesting ideas represented in the theme of the conference that uh, I just want to mention a couple of them. Uh, President Gaston mentioned that there are at least four dimensions when it comes to the work that has been done around educational equity and opportunity. The first one is concerned with the meanings and interpretation of educational opportunity, access and equity. And it is important for us to reflect on how this term, this idea, this construct has changed meaning over time, depending on different political times and historical times, as well as the state of the art in research, in education and other disciplines. The second theme is concerned with uh, issues related to the problems that are associated with unequal opportunity, as well as the methods that we use to examine issues of diversity and the complexities that come with it. The third theme around this idea of educational opportunity and equity is the significant need for interdisciplinary research, toolkits, theoretical and methodological that can allow us to address the complexities of this problem. And fourth, the significant need for linking policies to address, on the one hand, long-standing issues of equity that have endured over the generations, as well as emerging issues of educational opportunities, such as homelessness, trauma, incarceration, and so forth. So we have a distinguished panel this morning uh, that will address some of these issues. Uh, there were a few questions that were shared with the panel to think about. Each panelist will have the opportunity to engage them in the ways that make sense to them. And uh, what I'm going to do is to uh, introduce them. And then each of them will take turns for about 10, 15 minutes in the order that I'm going to be reading next. And we'll make it conversational. And then we'll open it up for discussion with the audience. So our panelists today are Prudence Carter, who is the Dean of UC Berkeley. Uh, Professor Gloria Latson billings from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Mark Lamont Hill from Morehouse College, and John Rogers from UCLA. And I'm gonna now switch the mic to them so they can take turns to share their thoughts, starting with Professor Carter. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I, I, I'd like to start off hopeful, and that, but as I look at my notes, they don't look so hopeful. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I think about this topic, so let me, I'm going to start off by um, raising something that challenges a fundamental ideology that is pervasive in our, our, demo, our uh, supposed democratic society about the relationship um, between education and later life outcomes. So I'm a sociologist, and generally as a sociologist, I think as a structuralist. But I also do more micro-level uh, research where I speak to people and try to understand meaning in their lives and how that influences and shapes their overall outcomes. And as I think about the research that I've done and what I've learned over the years and the research of others and look at the contours of patterns with educational disparities and economic disparities in our society, I believe now that it is time for us to change the pervasive dominant achievement ideology in American society. I don't mean to change it and get rid of it totally, but what I mean by that is that we inculcate from a very young age the idea that education's main purpose is to perform well so that you can get a good job. That it's about productivity, economic productivity in, in the United States. 
Meanwhile, in this moment, we have a fundamental moral and material crisis. The moral crisis is that we have many people who subscribe to the very strong individualistic culture that is about me and making sure I'm competitive so that I can get that which is mine, but we often do it to the detriment of the other. We do it to the exclusion of the other. And so what we have is a tension between what we profess to believe in a democracy that's supposed to be healthy and take care of all of its people, although we know that's pretty much a myth, but we say that as a democracy. And the cultural narrative that drives why we actually establish education the way we do. And then when we have the outcomes with the kinds of contours of disparities, the patterns that we have, we try to want to understand it and we want to attribute it to those who are just marginalized, who've been on the outside. We attribute it to their cultural orientations oftentimes, as opposed to taking a look and interrogating our own master cultural narratives in American society. And so when I think about this question about democracy and justice and education, I'm trying to understand how is it that we can actually move from the micro and meso levels where we can radically change the mindsets of people in this country so that we can actually change the, the material patterns, the outsets, the macro level phenomenon in this country. And, we often, and, and it may be bi-directional because we think we need policies change, economic policies, educational policies, and so forth. So it's the idea that the base will shape the superstructure, right? But the reality is we might need to get more Weberian, and I tend to be, uh, I'm a sociologist, but Weber talks about the superstructure actually has to, it fundamentally can shape the base. And what I mean by that is the things that we do in schools at a cultural level in terms of values and beliefs and, and, and attitudes about why we fundamentally engage in projects of education can have some impact on how we relate to each other, the kinds of things we think we need to teach. And in this cultural moment, critical political literacy is important, right? And we see we fail them that. Arts education can really matter as a medium to understand. We've cut that. And we actually are so comfortable with radical segregation in American society, which impedes the ability for different groups who, are, who have different attitudes and different material, social, and cultural realities to even relate with one another so that we know how to actually do difference in society. And we don't know how to do difference in American society. Look where we are now. So I want to suggest to you that it is time for us as an educational research community as we think about the ecology of the landscape of inequality in American society, which is supposed to be a democratic project, although much of what we're doing is belying that, is to start to think about the interrelationship between the master narrative of why we do education and the material outcomes and the political outcomes that we want to see in schools. So it's time to change dominant achievement ideology. It's time to expand it to expand what we mean about it. And the function can't just be instrumental because what that does is gets us into a me culture right now where a very small cabal or band or stratum of people are taking care of themselves to the detriment and fundamental marginalization of others. So that's what I have to say. That's how I started. <laughs> So you're going to just leave me hanging out like that. <laughs> Set a timer so I don't talk too much. Uh, good morning. Morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. We are in San Antonio, right? Yeah. Um, so something that I think people don't know about me is that a lifetime ago, I did a dissertation focused on citizenship and values among black students. And I, I want to drop down to that level of how we conceive the human subject. Um, actually, in many ways, Pruden set me up perfectly by talking about the sort of macro structure and how we look at the meso. And I want to really look at the individual in relation to that structure. So one of the things I've found and I, in, in the study with early adolescents, 
was while they had deep interest in what was happening around them, that interest was mediated by the racial and cultural lens and experiences that they had. So the study actually got conceived because I read the National Assessment of Educational Progress that suggested that black kids were less good citizens than white kids. They used to give a citizenship exam, not just the, the uh, social studies, math, science. But they used to give a citizenship exam. And so the headline that I read said, black kids are not as good citizens as whites. And I thought, dang, we can't even be good citizens? <laughs> so, so when I explored it, I took a look at the, the exam and sent off for what's called the released exercises, where you can, they, they will send you, if you pay for them, they'll send you the uh, items they will not use again. And I actually administered these items to 75 African-American eighth graders. But what I did differently than what Nate would typically do is not only did I get their answers, I interviewed all 75 of these kids about why you chose the answers you chose. So here's the first item, verbatim. Would you be willing to or prefer not to have a person of a different race or ethnicity, A, be your barber or beautician. <laughs> so I got 75 <laughs> incorrect answers <laughs> on item A, <clears throat> one A. But I interviewed these kids, and what did I hear? My brother went over there and let them people cut his hair, <laughs> jacked up, right? My sister let that woman do her hair. Now, the following questions, they got good at, you know, be your teacher, no problem. I mean, they, literally other things, but their own experiences, some other things that happened. Uh, the students were asked whether or not they paid attention to the news. Yeah, they all said yes. What's the most important uh, news item currently. Their answer, well, what, what would have been, quote, the correct answer was the Iran hostage crisis. The student's answer was the Atlanta child murders. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed them, they said, when I said, well, why didn't you pick the Iran hostage crisis? Over and over, what students said was, they let all the black people go, which was correct. So what I got from over 122 items was the fact that our civic engagement is often mediated through the racial and cultural spaces that we occupy. And you know, uh, Prudence has alluded to the kind of racial and cultural isolation if you are only around people in your racial, ethnic, or cultural, linguistic group, then you see yourself as a human subject constituted through that. And that will be true for white students, right? Mm -hmm. So this isolation, and in some ways encapsulation, uh, you know, my students listen to black radio, watched BET. I mean, they, they, that, was their, that, that was their experience. Uh, I asked them, one, one of the questions was, who is the governor? Correct answer at that time, believe it or not, we still at the same answer, Jerry Brown. Well, we're in California. <laughs> it had to be <coughs> four million years ago. But it was Jerry Brown. The student's answer was, often, not all of them, some, Willie Brown who was then speaker of the California Assembly. When I said, why are you choosing Willie Brown when it's actually Edmund Jerry Brown, they said, well, this is the one we see on TV. And if you follow Willie Brown's uh, story, he's always listed as, quote, the flamboyant, that, that adjective is in front of his name all the time, the flamboyant Willie Brown. Jerry Brown was kind of low key. At that time, we used to call him Governor Moonbeam right, because he was just kind of out there. So <laughs> interesting how the students perceived 
what was happening. Now, I say all of this to, to, to point to the fact that um, our sense of our ability to engage in the civic culture is sharply defined by how we are constituted as, quote, citizens of the society. Not too long ago, I just looked at the video of the four youngsters coming from playing basketball in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Minding their business, doing what early you know, tweens do. They were under a police gun for 10 minutes because someone thought that they had been involved in a fight. And you can hear this baby screaming, please, Mr. Policeman, don't shoot me. Please, please, I don't want to die. Now, invariably, they, the police find out they have the wrong kid. They apologize to the parents. But think of the trauma that these four kids have undergone. And how do they think of themselves as being citizens? What does the democracy mean to them? So the big question for me is when you construct an idea of a democracy, and quite frankly, you know, people will get on me sometimes and say, well, you're just bashing the U.S. No, I hold the U.S. to the standards it's held itself to, mm. which are quite high. Go back and read the documents. Even if they didn't include you in the beginning, they wrote it in a way that you can fit in there, right? So we have this large structure saying this is what democracy is and this is what it means to participate at the same moment where we have people tell them, no, you can't participate. Uh, I'll wrap up by saying it's in a study that was done many years ago took many of the tenets of both the Declaration and the Constitution out of context. You know, things like individual rights or, um, you know, uh, rights against uh, search and seizure, unwarranted search and seizure, and they just did surveys and asked people what they thought about those individual things. And people, quote, reject them. This is communist. No. So we don't understand democracy as a people. And yet it has, it holds with it, I think, the promise of better futures, better lives. But if you are not constructed as a citizen, if you are not considered, if because of the way you look or speak already makes you suspect, hmm. then how can a democracy function? And how can a democracy function if, if as you know, Prudence alluded to, if our vision of the preparation of people for the democracy is that we're just preparing them to be workers? That's actually more akin to a more communist notion, hmm. that you just make them workers. And yet, that's, that's, the, that's the substance of our discourse. So I think I'll stop there, and then I think John, okay. you up. Oh, Mr. Hill will go Mark. next. Mark. Thank you. Good morning, I never used one of these before. Yes, good morning, everybody. I, I'm, I'm actually glad to go. Well, not really, because they said all the good stuff, but um, I'm happy to go after Prudence and Gloria because one of the things Gloria talked about was whether or not one is constituted as a citizen. And I think that's really important to think about, particularly in the context of black folk, right? Who, in many ways, the very notion of black citizenship is relatively new post-1965 Voting Rights Act is the first moment where black folk can even say they have access full, fully to a democratic process around, around the franchise. So the way we imagine citizenship and freedom and other things are going to be linked to a different social imagination. They're going to be linked to a different set of material consequences. They're going to be linked to a different set of circumstances, a different set of expectations about how the world functions. But what's interesting to me is not just sort of if you get constituted as a citizen, but also what it means in the current historical moment to be constructed as a citizen. In other words, how do we collectively understand and imagine citizenship in the 21st century? Citizenship itself is a social construct. Democracy itself is an idea that shifts across time and space and from person to person. So what are the forces, what are the institutions, what are the power relationships that define and maybe even over-determine citizenship in 2017, in the age of Trump? 
And I don't mean Trump as president, I mean the kind of neo-fascist moment that we've emerged in kind of following, coming out of a neoliberal moment. What does it mean to be a citizen? For me, one of the challenges of the democracy and citizenship in the 21st century is that our very notion of citizenship is tethered so tightly to market values. So that we often, and it's become kind of neo, uh, kind of, there I, there I go with it, but it's, it's become sort of an academic tick to talk about neoliberalism and to kind of frame it. But I, I do think it's significant to think about what it means for the market and the market values to shape who and what we are. Our very identities are linked to that. Our understanding of who we're supposed to be, our understanding of, of, of citizenship has been conflated with consumership. So the idea of what it means to be an American and to be a citizen is to have certain kinds of things and to accumulate certain types of things. And so therefore, when we imagine citizenship in a grander sense, we're not just thinking about whether we can vote or how it means to engage others, but we're thinking about what it means to, to be part of a marketplace and to, and to do that in the context of individualism. So a kind of collective value has been replaced by an individualistic value. And I don't mean to be nostalgic and suggest that there was this moment where people weren't selfish or people weren't individualistic. But if our very notion of citizenship is linked to what I have, that becomes a problem. If in our faith communities, right, the, the, the marginalized gospels of prosperity get moved from the margins to the center such that the idea that who I am as a believer, or who I am as a person of faith is tethered to how much money I have, or how much money my preacher has, or how wealthy my imam is, then if that becomes the measure of my faith and who I am as a believer, who I am as a quote unquote child of some grand being, then again, I have whittled down citizenship. I have whittled down democracy to a, to a dollar sign, to a value. That becomes another democratic crisis. One of the things we've always thought about when we talk about democracy is the public sphere. Now, I'm not trying to kind of resurrect Habermas and suggest that there was this great moment in the 19th century where everybody was in this great you know, Masonic hall or, or salon or bookstore or cafe where we were all kind of deliberating about the, the, the role of the state and challenging state power and, and reimagining democratic possibilities. Black folk were, if we were in those houses, we were working. If we were lucky enough to be working in those houses, we weren't allowed to be in Masonic lodges. That's why there was a Prince Hall, main one in Philly. Just so you know, we got glory up there, so we got to shout out Philly every time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not suggesting that there was ever a moment where everybody was included. But what I am suggesting is that those same market values and market forces are compromising those spaces where we could operate. So while Habermas talks about the democratic public sphere, you had Nancy Fraser and others, you had a, a whole cadre of really brilliant feminist scholars, for example, and queer scholars who said, wait a minute, these places have never been inclu inclusive of queer folk. These places have never been inclusive of trans folk. Black folk could never go here. But what we could do was access new spaces, right? So we might not get to the bookstore, but we could get to the church and we could organize, right? We could get to the local black books. So we could go to Marcus Books in, in Oakland. We could go to Hakeem's on, 50, on 52nd Street. Right. We could go to Human in New York in a, in a newer moment. Right. We could do these things. We go to Shrine and the Black Madonna in Atlanta. But the problem is now, again, because market values have trumped the kind of the, the kind of grander democratic values, those places get eaten up by the market, too. So you got because you have the Amazonification of bookstores for just to give you one example, because that's one of my areas of expertise. You, now, all of a sudden, there is no bookstore for us to hang out in the, in the back. We can't. Marcus, thank God, is still alive. But the bookstore is. But a whole lot of places get closed down. So we don't have that, those places, because now we've been relocated to the digital sphere. Folk who could be access public space aren't accessing public space because public space itself has come under attack under a neo-fascist moment where we're suddenly, uh, again, not allowing people to assemble in public. We got gang, uh, uh, and we got uh, essentially indictments of, what do you call them? Uh, civil injunctions against gangs, that's the word I was looking for, which becomes a catch-all to stop black folk from being outside. You got all these other things that make democratic participation in the public sphere almost impossible. So this becomes a dark moment. And I know this hasn't been like a motivational speech so far this morning for any of us. <laughs> but I do, I, so I just want to pivot in the last minute to, to one more thing. And that is that despite all this, I, st I still feel like there's something possible. You know, when I think about democratic possibilities, I think of Maxine Green, which is why I'm glad you mentioned the arts. I think about when she talks about releasing the imagination. When we have the ability to think about schools differently, we have the ability to think about democratic life differently. We can take a larger aerial view of the world and see new possibilities. We can craft something different. Robin Kelly talked about the freedom dream. Black folks' struggles have always been linked to a dream. They've always been linked to a different social imagination. The telos of our freedom struggle has always been a little bit different. We always expected a different kind of outcome. So I'm saying that at this moment, despite how dark it is, 
We don't have to live in a world where authority gets confused with authoritarianism in schools or, 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 or uh, you know, kind of, uh, the kind of individual life that we want. Standards in school don't get reduced to standardization, right? Where we can have accountability without it being reduced to a kind of micro testing regime. We can imagine new possibilities. Do we want us to think about democracy not simply as a set of practices and procedures, not as a set of rigid rituals, but as something bigger? Let's think about democracy as a verb. Let's think about democracy as an identity. And let's craft new democracies, new selves, new sites of possibility that aren't reduced to the market, that aren't reduced to white supremacy, that aren't reduced to neoliberalism, that aren't reduced to capitalism, but that allow us to be something different than we've ever been. If we do that, we could be all right even in this dark moment. Thank you. John Rogers. Good morning. 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 In the last 100 days, I've had the chance to sit down with various different people to talk about. In the last 100 days, I've had a chance to sit down with various different people to talk with them about the meaning of democracy and justice in the age of Trump. I've been sitting down with folks recording these interviews and then sharing them with our CenterX community at UCLA. CenterX houses our teacher education program, our principals program, and various different professional development. So we've been sharing them with educators and community members around Los Angeles. And I think some of the insights that have emerged about dialogue and resistance in the age of Trump inform our conversations today. So I want to try and draw in some of their voices, both about the nature of the threat that is being posed and the way in which resistance through dialogue has emerged. So let me begin with a couple passages about the effects of these first 100 days. I'll start with a dialogue we posted yesterday um, from Jose Navarro, who's a principal at the northern edge of Los Angeles and his school sits right next to this open field, which um, filmmakers in Los Angeles sometimes use to, to do film shoots. So he tells me, recently there was a filming right next door to our campus at the swap meet, and there were a lot of white vans there. I see it because I'm out front every morning. Parents were doing U-turns as they were trying to drop their kids off. I was getting calls on my cell phone. Kids were walking up to me. One came up and asked me, Mr. Navarro, is that ICE? Is that ICE? I can't come to school. I, I said, that's not ICE. They're filming a movie. You can call your mom, it's okay. While I was outside, my secretaries had 20 phone calls about that. They were just filming a movie. Back in March, we posted a dialogue with five 11th graders at a high school in South LA. I asked them about how their schooling had been affected by the first few days, first few weeks of the Trump presidency. Here's a few of the students' responses. Rosaria, he wants to make all these immigration laws and deport a lot of people, and in this community, there's a lot of immigrants. During school, many students can't really concentrate because they're scared, and they're thinking about what if something happens to them, so they pull back. Jackie, yeah, Trump already deported thousands of immigrants. Many of my neighbors could, at any moment, be taken away. We have students who are worried about their parents and saying, What's gonna to happen to me if something happens to my parents? Will I go with them to where they were born? Will I stay here? And it just causes a lot of drama. I know a lot of kids that go to school here who are not citizens, but they want to learn. They come here for a reason. I think they deserve equal rights if they're here and they're learning. They're not here doing bad things, they're here to learn. Taya, I feel very disappointed with this country because we basically voted in a racist and a bigot. And then people just are so surprised after he does all this stuff. He's done this Muslim ban, and he does all this stuff. And all of a sudden, people want to act so surprised, and he's doing all of this. I just feel like you should have listened when he was making all these statements and showing us what a president is not supposed to do and how a president shouldn't act. So I just feel like it's disappointing for everybody because this older generation basically determined our future for us. We didn't get to choose it. I want to underscore what Taya said. She said, you should have listened. Of course, she's telling us as adults 
we should have listened to this threat, this threat to our political community, this threat to civility, this threat to vulnerable people. We should have listened. Hmm. Now, alongside this insightful critique, my Just Talk partners, who include immigration lawyers, who include scholars, who include students and educators, they've also spoken eloquently to the relationship between dialogue and resistance. And I just want to pull out a couple ways that they speak to this. So first, um, in February, um, right after Trump's um, so-called Muslim ban, we posted a dialogue with the Karij Collective, which includes the scholars Arshad Ali, Mariam Kashani, and Shireen Basaji. And I want to I want to just point to this one brief quote where they talk about creating collective spaces of dialogue and resistance. So they say, like young people within many communities of color, Muslim youth have also actively created their own spaces and organizations, much as Mark was talking about, within schools and universities to support one another, to learn about their histories, to practice and often remix their cultural and linguistic inheritance, to find camaraderie and shared experience of exclusion, and to use humor, <clears throat> art, and music to express the full range of their critiques, identities, and vision. In December, we posted a dialogue with Tyrone Howard, who had just published an amazing report um, about successful young men of color in greater Los Angeles. And Tyrone lifted up the power of counter storytelling, of, of educators affirming young people's experiences and listening to the stories of their resistance. Here's how Tyrone responded to my question about what's called for in this moment. He said, educators have got to double down on humanization the care and the strengthening of relationships with our young people. And Tyrone goes on to say, we must understand their challenge. It requires us to help them understand that their stories are important, that their struggles are real, that their day-to-day -day challenges are realities that people care about, and that they have an important place in the fabric of who we are as a nation. At the end of March, we posted a dialogue I did with three high school students in East LA. These young men are part of a group called Urban Scholars Compadres, which is a YPAR collective that's led by their teacher, Eddie Lopez. They spoke with extraordinary grace about restorative justice, a subject that they've been studying but also practicing in their schools. And they talked about the ways that restorative justice circles have helped to promote healing and understanding and critique within their school. I just want to share a few thoughts about the, the, this dialogic process that they said. Leon says, the whole point of a restorative justice circle is to see everyone's differences, but to see the similarities that you share with people in the circle as well. And if you see that you have similarities with some other people in that circle, it is usually easier to build relationships with, with those people. This is one of the fundamental ways of looking at restorative justice, the connections we make through community building circles. Abraham then weighed in. I think it all starts with just one person that shares something personal and deep. And once that person shares something, then somebody else will feel comfortable enough. And when circles get deep, it moves me because it shows you a different perspective from what you think people might be going through and you might not even notice. And then Tony, who's a musician, says, I think what gives me hope at times like this is something that Jimi Hendrix said. When the power of love outweighs the love of power, the world will know peace. And I think what we're doing here with restorative justice is really kind of spreading love. We don't exactly go into a room and promise, hey, you're going to love this person and they're going to love you back. We just open the door for it to happen. If you walk into a room with 10 strangers and you walk out and there's still 10 strangers, you're not spreading the love the way I think is what the world needs. But if you walk in and you get to know these people, there's potential there. And that's something that keeps me hopeful. Finally, let me point to um, a dialogue with the 11th graders in South LA I referenced before. Um, they are members of a youth organizing group called Students Deserve that's been organizing for expanding <clears throat> rights and pushing back against the security guards and police doing random searches in their school. And through their youth organizing, they have engaged in dialogue and action that has allowed them to deepen their critique and broaden their sense of their collective 
possibilities. Jackie says, I think this is a time where people are asking, what do we do? What do we do? Like, what can we do? So this is part where we should all inform them that it's going to be okay. We have rights. We can all get together. The U.S. has a legacy of so many social movements, and within those movements, you have strong people who said, this is what we do. We have to join together. So this is where the programs come into play. We're here to inform people, and that is when and how we fight back. We have rights, and when we join together, we're not all doing our own thing and just being scared. And that's when we can make an actual change by sticking together. April. Through unity, we can force them to listen to us. Taya. I feel like this program was made for a reason. So that through events like this, this way of coming together can help us and help show America really is how, and help show how America really is towards people of color and all who are oppressed. So all four stories that I've shared speak to the importance of opening up space for more robust dialogue than we often hear in the dominant airways. It speaks to the need to have more expansive dialogue, dialogue that is critical, dialogue that <coughs> evokes our collective humanity. And that reminds me of an argument that John Dewey made exactly 90 years ago in The Public and Its Problems. In the closing passage of that book, he pushes back against the notion that in politics we should just be looking um, and using our eyes to view this spectacle of politics. He says, we need to engage, we need to participate, and that invokes the need to use our ears. He says, vision is a spectator, hearing is a participator. Publication is partial, and the public which results is partially informed and formed until the meanings it purveys pass from mouth to mouth. There is no limit, Dewey asserts, to the possibilities which may proceed from the flow of social intelligence that circulates by mouth to mouth from one another in the communications of the local community. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, these have been a very um, thought-provoking set of ideas and arguments that I hope will take up um, as we move into this session. I uh, wanted to start with a set of questions to get some more discussion among the panelists, and then we'll open it up for uh, the audience to engage with us as well. So we've got a pretty comprehensive picture painted so far. We heard about scale. We heard about the need to connect scales from micro to meso to macro. We were reminded that civic engagement is a cultural idea, that it's, there is definitely a cultural nature of civic engagement, that we need to tackle and engage in more critical ways with the ideologies that are shaping everything around citizenship and democracy in terms of economic productivity. And finally, we understand that the power of voice and perspective are critical in engaging some of these difficult times. So all of this is in front of us at a time in which choice and individual rights are gaining very particular power to benefit certain segments of the citizenry. <clears throat> at a time in which science is being construed in very particular narrow ways and dismissed in very problematic fashion. At a time in which facts are relative and not very relevant for policy and other kinds of decisions. So how do we, the first question I have in, uh, as I contemplate all of these complexities and dimensions of this issue is, we are an organization of educational researchers. How do we leverage the power of educational research, not only to inform, but to begin to shape responses to this state of affairs, to begin to think about educational reform that will tackle some of these issues that are making us question the nature and the value of democracy through the experiences of students in schools and universities. How do we leverage the power of educational research to inform those changes and to begin to shape those responses. Any random thoughts you might want to share? Yes, Mark. I, I think one thing we have to do is imagine our professional responsibility and the kind of goal of our inquiry to extend beyond the academy. We have to begin from a place of saying this work has to matter. We've been talking a lot about Dewey, but I mean, what's fascinating about Dewey is 
not just his engagement in the world, or rather in the academic world, but also his engagement in the broader public, whether it's working in the Niagara meetings, helping to shape the NAACP as a, you know, as a kind of shadow board member, whether it's what his work with the public schools, not always the best work, but his attempts to, to leverage insights and resources beyond the academy is significant. Some of us uh, engage in research, which is significant, but it never makes it outside the walls of the academy. And I think there are multiple ways to do that. I'm not suggesting everybody go on TV or, or do that, but, but what I do think is important is to make your, make your findings accessible outside yeah. of the academy, because that's how we leverage our insights. The problem, as you mentioned, is that notions of facticity are being kind of obscured by rhetoric coming from folk who, who, who have uninformed opinions, or uninformed claims. And we need to be out there fighting to leverage our claims and our insights so we can make our work accessible. We can, we can write to broader audiences. We can make executive summaries of our work so that people can get it. We can make scholars, if, if y'all say, look, I'm just trying to write my scholarly article, cool, but at least make it accessible. And just through open access principles, you can, in, in your institutional repositories, you can make the, the, the articles that you write and the findings that you produce accessible to other ac academics. Because some of, I'm at Morehouse. So some of y'all write articles, I can't even access at the library, huh. right? So, but if you put it on your website, 90% of, of academic journals can be accessible um, through open access if you, if you put it on your institutional website. So just something as small as that can matter. So I think we need to have a bigger vision of where, who our audience is and what these various publics are that we want to access. Okay. I also think um, we need to be cognizant of what has become the evacuation of the public space. And it didn't just happen. You know, we're sort of running around as the sky is falling. Well, it's been falling for a while. <laughs> Uh, and there have been some pillars of, of the public that have just disappeared. As Mark knows, I grew up in Philly. I traveled the entire city on buses, mm -hmm. trolleys, and subways. Public transportation gave me access because it was cheap, reliable, and dependable. I wouldn't ride a trolley in Philly today if you, <laughs> right? Because it really has become this place where no, it's, it's dangerous and, and, and you know, um, many of my relatives in order to get that leg up in the society, applied for and got into public housing. It wasn't fancy, but it was safe. It was reliable, dependable, and economical. And it was a place where they could begin to save money so that at one time they could go in and, and buy a home. I got my polio vaccine at the public health clinic because it was safe, accessible, reliable, dependable. All of those structures have fallen away. So you have this one little wobbly domino called public education where almost everybody in my neighborhood sent their children because they were safe, reliable, dependable, and they were the way in which you got to move up in the society. So we moved away from, we've evacuated all those public spaces, and now what we say is the public space is the digital space. Hmm. And we talk about that as the, democ the democratization of voices and ideas. No, it's anarchy out there. Hmm. Because there are really no checks on saying, they offering abortions in the back of this diner, you know. And I mean, literally, we have no. It is quote the wild wild west in the uh, in the digital space. So the question for me is, how do we bring ourselves back to a public? How do we participate in that public? And how do we ensure that it is not cordoned off by just certain voices? Uh, but at the same moment, not just crazy stuff. Uh, I think Mark's point about, as academics, where, how we enter the conversation, we have got to go beyond just journals. We have got to go beyond just books that cost $119. <laughs> you know, we have got to get in those spaces, whether they are uh, churches and mosques and uh, community building, uh, uh, community organizations. Um, and, some, and for some of us, we need to work with people who are better at saying our words. Mm -hmm. You know, we know how to talk to each other. You know, I always say that graduate school is a place where we take perfectly good writers and wreck them. <laughs> and 
indigenization. Because, right. Because, <laughs> you know, because you used to write a sentence and you were done. You know, now your sentence is a paragraph long. It's like so some of us need to work with others. And I, I'll give you an example of what, what I think is a good example, and I'm using this book a lot now. Bill Ayers took his book to teach, and Bill is actually pretty accessible in his writing, but yeah. he took the book to teach and turn it into a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. my, or a graphic book, it's not a novel. My students love this book. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can literally see the story. Uh, Congressman John Lewis has done the same thing yeah. with the civil rights. Here's a graphic novel. I can show you the story as well as tell you. So I think we need to be able to engage in these more creative forms uh, of getting our information out there. Uh, that people can access. So I w and I agree about the, the, the we need to be multiliterate, we need to be multidiscursive, we need to we need to create a core or a new generation of scholar researchers who can actually straddle across these various spheres of communication. Uh, but I I, I want to flip our attention and think about another part of the population that we don't center in our professional organizations. There are, there are hundreds of people here, and I don't want to insult anyone, who do research in this area, but it's not the center or the, the, the more sexy research mm -hmm. that we hear at the conferences. On November, what is it, 6th, when, that, um, when the results, was it the 8th? Mm -hmm. When those results came out, the first thing I thought to myself was, wow, there are a whole lot of people in American society that we really don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I realized, I grew up in small town USA, Mississippi Delta, um, but, and there's been a lot written about the poor, and particularly when the objects of inquiry are people of color and poor, or linguistic minorities, but there's not a whole lot that's been written about those small town, really poor white America. Mm -hmm. And, or even centering those those discourses. It's, some things have been written, and actually, the one of the most popular books right now is uh, Hillbilly, Hillbilly Elegy, Elegy, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a concern to me. There was a tweet going around last night that says, "Academic elites, political elites, and media elites are are domestic threats." And when the academic got in there, I thought, "Uh oh!" And I know where it's coming from because it's probably in response to the university I work for, right? <laughs> Um, and, and, and there is an aspect, there's a certain segment of society, um, there's a whole population that we don't center in the American Educational Research Association, the American Psycho Sociological Association, the American Political Science. We center the urban, we center the, mi the minority, we center the poor, and, uh, and these, mem these people are also part of uh, various categorizations. And I don't mean decentering people who are in need. But I think it's important for us to fundamentally understand how to bridge, how to understand how to center those populations because they spoke with their, with their votes. And these are also populations where there need to be critical political literacies cultivated. These are populations that are very comfortable in their rigid segregation, this modes. Um, these, are these are populations of individuals who are going to church they are and mostly evangelical church spaces where they're being told by religious leaders various things that actually undermine the democratic mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. And so the question is for me, and this is half of America, how do we change those spaces? How do we interrogate? How do we, how do we, um, it is not so much that people can't be different or have a different economic or political or social ideology. But how do you do it in a way that is not even, to the extent that you're not even undermining your own existence? Mm. And to me, that's a really, really fundamental question. How is it that you're not succumbing to economic hegemony in a way that you would vote for someone who does yeah. not care about your material interests? You will vote for someone who does not care if you were to die because mm -hmm. it won't guarantee universal health care mm -hmm. for you in a way or make it affordable for you. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that I think we have to think about as educational researchers. There are hundreds of people here who actually investigate, who work in these communities, understand it. But why isn't it centered? Mm -hmm. Why don't I know more? Why don't we know more? 
And that's because we, the object of inquiry for us is so comfortable to be the urban, minority, poor, and there's some problems with that um, in many ways. So I, I, I'm gonna stop there because I, I, I might get myself in trouble if I say it a little bit more. Yeah. John, do you wanna say yeah. something? I, I wanna go back to Gloria's point about the erosion of public spaces. Is, that speaks to the need for a civic infrastructure project. We need to do rebuilding. And I believe that the academy has a role to play in that. We're not the only players, and if we're the only players, that would be problematic, but we can contribute. And I was looking before and saw my, my wonderful colleague, Yana Shadak Hernandez out there, who works at the UCLA Labor Center. And the UCLA Labor Center is a wonderful model of how a public space can be created. In MacArthur Park in Los Angeles, there's this space in which you have members of the janitor's union and the securities guard union and graduate students and faculty and young people coming together, talking about issues together and making meaning of the world in order to figure out how they can respond. Universities need to invest their material, um, th their material resources, their human capabilities in such spaces. We need to be part of this project of building this civic infrastructure. Thank you all. I'm going to shift gears here and uh, reflect on something that is happening and we haven't spent enough time as an educational research community pondering in relation to democracy and education as well as citizen justice. When we think about the work of Nancy Fraser, among others, in terms of how we think uh, about the notion of justice, uh, we know that two trends have been predominant. We have been concerned with issues of representation and issues of redistribution. Now, we're living at a time in which mobility is the norm. People have alliances and affinities, but the reality is that um, identities are increasingly fluid. When you look at the research on the sociology of um, identities and anthropology of education, we see students who might be affiliated with an African-American culture moving back and forth between cultural practices, linguistic practices that are beyond their cultural repertoires. We see Filipino students using Chicano English in conversations in hallways and so forth. So the idea of identity is changing significantly. We have also incredible interdependence between what's happening in San Antonio, Texas and what's happening in Southeast Asia by the minute. Yeah. And this idea of where I belong which kind of citizenship I'm going to be ascribing to and, sus and uh, subscribing to are really challenging how we think about justice and whether we should be privileging redistribution of resources for people who have alliances in multiple places and communities and uh, recognition when people have multiple kinds and more fluid understandings of affiliation. So what can we do as educational researchers to begin to bring some sense of order to approaching democracy, approaching citizens, citizenship justice in a world in which all of these things are in flux? Are there things that we know in educational research that we should be taking into account to engage this idea of redistribution, representation around justice, given these trends? I'll, I'll just say one thing real fast. I know we want to get some audience stuff in, too. Um, I think we need to follow the, I mean, you mentioned sociology and anthropology. And I'll focus specifically on anthropology. I, th I think educational researchers could benefit from following the trends over the last 20 or 30 years, which is to understand culture and citizenship and identity in the transnational context. Mm -hmm. Very often, our research and our work remains in the United States. So the example you just gave is incredibly interesting and important, right? We'll, we'll understand uh, San Antonio, but don't link what's happening in San Antonio, what's happening on the other side of the border in terms of our work, right? Um, we'll talk about uh, a question of justice or a question of immigration, but only look at it on one side. I mean, one of the most interesting texts I read this year was uh, Thea Abul Hedge's uh, book on, uh, on Palestinian uh, students who come to the United States. Mm -hmm. So now, because there's a lot of really interesting Middle East studies work in Palestine and Palestinian youth, and there's a lot of stuff on the immigration process, but not looking at it on, this, on the other side, of the, uh, the other end of it. Understanding those two things in context, right? 
for the last 25, 30 years in anthropology, we've been talking about these different scapes, right? The Paterai talks about the ethnoscape and the technoscape and the finance scape and all these ways that cultural flows happen, that flows happen, right? Whether it's finance, money, all these things, it's incredibly important as we think about how labor moves in a different direction, as we think about how technology moves in another direction. But oftentimes our research remains locked in one space. So as a practical matter, when we do multi-sided ethnography, maybe we shouldn't just be looking at three schools in the same city. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should be following the, 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 the global process of consumption, production, reception, et cetera, across a global context. Those kinds of processes, those kinds of projects would allow us to understand our work in global context and situate our work in global context. As teachers, I mean, as graduate school professors, I mean, we should be probably offering more texts that, for example, when we teach ethnographic texts, they, they don't often be in the United States. Mm -hmm. right? Our theoretical stuff doesn't have to be in the United States. That's right. And so connecting those dots will help us understand the global context of these things, of justice. Right. I also think that um, Mark's earlier point about the reduction of uh, the citizen to the sort of economic value speaks a lot to um, the challenge that we are facing. Uh, Iwa Ong's work on flexible citizenship talks about the fact that we have created a global economic uh, environment in which people don't feel allegiance to political geopolitical spaces because they're not staying in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And it's not just elites that are moving around the world, or very poor people moving around the world chasing jobs. So if I'm working 14, 16 hours in a sweatshop in San Francisco, I don't really care about what the ordinances are because I'm not, I have no time to participate in civic culture there. And if that job should then take me to Terre Haute, Indiana, then that's where I'm going. And if that job goes right back to somewhere in Asia, I mean, I'm, I'm chasing, I'm trying to stay alive. So I think the point about um, the sort of transnational understanding of what's happening, that it's not just happening here. I was in a, a school in Stockholm. There was not one white student in that school. <laughs> You could literally, in the class I was sitting in, you could literally be, make sense of everything that was happening in the New York Times by looking at that classroom. Mm -hmm. There were Somalians there. There were uh, kids from Iran. There were kids from um, Syria. And it's like, wow, I mean, how, how is this even happening? And yet we think in a very local box uh, we make curriculum decisions quite locally. We want texts that uh, valorize our experience. Um, and so part of our work, I think, that, that you've really hit on is that it has to become a much more international conversation. Uh, we can't just keep doing our own ancestor worship, citing mm -hmm. ourselves all the time, right? We have got to see what else is happening in the world um, because I think that's the opportunity that we have to participate. And then I, and I think Pruden's point about, you know, how do you get people to really vote against their own self-interest um, is one that I don't think we've figured out at all. You know, what, what, what's the lever? Now, you know, I'll, I'll put in my typical plug, I'm a critical race theorist. I know what I think the lever <laughs> is. Uh, because I might be poor and I might not have no money, but if I can say at least I'm white, Right. You know, that, that, that's co-signed in the society. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to have you guys prove me wrong on that. <laughs> okay. Well, I, this, it's really interesting because last week I was uh, doing some technical advising um, with a school out in California. And it wants to be a very innovative school. And I said, you know, quite frankly, the best practices may not be in the United States. You have to look abroad. Mm -hmm. And we don't, uh, we don't think about places abroad in some ways. And the way I've been more immediately thinking about it is um, in terms of, I'm a race scholar as well, in thinking about actually how we even theorize about race and this whole notion of transraciality that's mm -hmm. come up. And I won't bring that controversy up because you all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what I think is so fascinating in the United States is that we don't look to other places that have been hyper-racialized and also moving towards the democratic project. In South Africa, for example, there have been racial chameleons mm -hmm. where you could actually petition the state under apartheid you could petition, and move your racial classification. Mm -hmm. Now, 
it's very fascinating that if you go into the apartheid museum and you see the numbers of people who moved across the various permit, uh, identity categories, no one ever went from white to black. <laughs> but they went to everything else. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the point is, is that the state allowed, and we don't theorize about race in the way that you could actually say, when I think about, so, so when I think about, uh, this is just really to kind of underscore the point, is that when we start talking about these ideas that have fundamentally organized our society, in terms of identity from race to class and such, it is really important to do a comparative project mm -hmm. because we then can fully and holistically understand the social construction of things. And so it's really been, as I've been thinking about this notion of transraciality or people, the ability. The other thing, and then I'll shut up, is that I think it's important for us to disentangle the micro level of identity and belonging from the macro level. I think people can always ascribe and choose what they want to be. It's the context, the material context, that makes check that. Yeah. And that actually determines who you are in that society or in that context. And so it's, it, there is a tension there that I think we don't tease out a lot. That's right. So if I, you know, I can very well, volunteerism, I can very well choose to say I want to be a rabbit. But the society is not going to look at me like a rabbit, right, because of the material context. But I may actually go into a context that's more open. I could live, talking about global boundaries, and say, well, we have full volunteerism here in this country. Now, that's hypothetical. And if you, you know, you have communities here, here's a rabbit community. You might want to be a rabbit. I mean, I don't mean to be silly and make light of things. The point is that context matters. Mm -hmm. And the interplay between the macro and the micro, really, and that's something that we have to really keep yeah, in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent point. So, I, I think Alfredo's question also has, um, has important relevance to how we think about preparing educators, teachers, and principals, and sustained work with them. If it's important for researchers to be thinking about representation and redistribution, we need to have educators being involved in those conversations as well. My colleague Joel Westheimer and I have been engaged in a study about what high school age youth in the US and Canada are learning about economic inequality. And one of the things that we've seen is that educators are more likely to teach that subject and to teach it with depth, depth and complexity if they themselves are engaged in political conversations, civic conversations about these related issues, not surprisingly. But if we want teachers to be able to engage youth with depth and understanding about representation and redistribution, they need to be involved in those conversations themselves. And so we need to think about how that gets inserted into our teacher preparation and to our principal preparation. Thank you. Let's take another five minutes and then we'll switch to open it up. Um, the idea of education, democracy, and citizen justice is typically grounded in discussions and assumptions about rights, having rights. We tend to forget oftentimes in these discussions that some people don't necessarily think they have the right to have rights. They might come from contexts, sometimes different national contexts, in which the idea of having a right is very foreign to them. Uh, there seems to be some sense of entitlement people need to think that they have rights, oftentimes, that a lot of people take for granted and others do not necessarily feel comfortable demanding things because they have rights. So I think we need to engage this idea of the right to have rights in discussions about education, democracy, and citizen justice, especially when we think about the <laughs> incredible level of trauma children and youth are exposed in many areas of the United States because of hate crimes, because of microaggressions, and all the other experiences that come with police brutality and so forth. So when we think about this idea of rights to have rights, what are the implications for educational research and educators for subject matters like civic education? How do we approach this work? How do we begin to open a discussion? It's not enough to say you have rights and demand to have them fulfilled. There is something more emotional and existential to the idea of having rights that we haven't even begun to think in many places around civic education. <clears throat> Any thoughts about this idea of the notion of rights to have rights in relation to civic education and other areas of education? I think it's existential. I agree with you and I think it's emotional, but I think it's also material because there are very concrete spaces in which people don't, let me back up actually. So I think, what it, to answer your question directly, I think what it means is that we have to reimagine what citizenship is and as we analyze citizenship and we unpack citizenship and we begin to use citizenship or citizens as a unit of analysis in our research, 
we have to draw on a wider range of conceptions of citizenship. Historically, what we've done is we've, we've, we've measured citizenship by the juridical, right? We've looked at citizenship based on law. We've, we've assessed citizenship based on people's relationship to a nation state, right? Um, for example, my, my, the research I'm doing right now is in Palestine. I, I study a community of Afro-Palestinians in East Jerusalem. Hmm. And, and so a lot of the conversation around citizenship is about what rights do I have as someone who lives in Israel proper versus someone in the West Bank versus someone who's in East Jerusalem, technically West Bank, but different in relationship versus Gaza, et cetera. What relationship do I have as, as a citizen? But I think part of what we learned, again, from anthropology, I would say, in the last 30 years is that we need to kind of expand our conception of citizenship, not just to think about the juridical, but to think about everyday ways of belonging, the ways that, every, that people on a daily basis feel like they are connected to a nation state, the, the ways that people feel like citizens, irrespective of what the law says. Sometimes people can feel very much a citizen, um, despite the fact that they don't have legal citizenship. Conversely, I could talk to Yazidis, or I could talk to uh, uh, Romanis in Italy, I could talk to uh, Algerians in France, who, who maybe have been there for five decades or, or 10 decades and still don't have a sense of belonging and citizenship. Um, we link that to the United States for a moment. I think there are ways that, like you said, there's, this, there's an emotional and an existential question of, is this my nation? Is this my country? Do I fit? Do I belong? But then there's a very concrete material question of, when I call the police, do they come? And when they come, will they, will they arrest me even though I'm the one that called them, right? right? So these kinds of questions make you think about citizenship in, in different ways. Yeah. So if I can just pick up on that, because I, I think Mark's point suggests that it's both knowing what your rights are and then knowing how to enact the political power to ensure that those rights are upheld. The, the students I, I invoked before from Students Deserve, this youth organizing group in South LA, they talked about the fact that before they began to be involved in this organizing group, they felt like their experiences in school were the same as being in prison because they were constantly being wanted, searched, and treated um, in, in a dehumanizing way by security guards. As they began these conversations, they began to see their rights. But as they began to enact power through this organizing group, they saw that they could push and enact these rights so that they had real meaning. And I think it's that combination of knowledge with power that's critical to this rights conversation. I also think there's an interesting tension that always emerges when we talk about rights, because it's not merely those people who don't think they have the right to have rights. It's also those people who believe they have more rights right. than they actually do. <laughs> yeah. And believe that they can do and say um, things that, like, really, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> um, and we see this often um, in the way in which our schools are structured. You know, because we go to schools you know, defined by zip codes and neighborhoods and communities, we have a gathering of very like-minded people. And so police going into, quote, an urban school doesn't raise an eyebrow. But when the police went into the high school in Saratoga, California, there was such a pushback from parents. How dare you uh, go into my child's locker? Well, actually, that's not your child's locker. That's the school's locker. That's right. And they don't have rights at that. But, but that, so I think that's an interesting tension. And I just really want to end um, my comment here, because I just got word that uh, I, I was on the panel that was selecting the uh, National Youth Poet Laureate. And now I know who the winner is, and I can say who it is. It's a young woman named uh, Amanda Gorman from Los Angeles. Oh, nice. And it's a lovely. A uh, poster that we we are, we will be distributing that speaks exactly to the stuff we're talking about. It's and it's it's a piece of her work that says, "When I thought I was an alien, abandoned by my true relatives, my body stiff as a ruler, my figure thin as a sheet of math homework, and R's that would die on my lips," she told me, "Nothing that is human can be alien to me." <laughs> so that sense of we are not just these atomistic or even geopolitical uh, uh, aggregates. We are fundamentally human. And actually, our humanity is greater than our citizenship. Um, those are pieces that I think we are, are losing because we are, we're reducing people to, 
Well, if you're not, quote, a citizen and don't have rights, you also don't have humanity. And I think that's a place we have exactly. to get to. That's beautiful. Food. I just, I've been pondering how do you write and make more perfect a union um, that whose very genesis is built on such imperfect processes. Mm. And when I kind of think about rights right now, I wonder and what it means to have a sense of belonging even if you are, quote, a citizen, <clears throat> you know, because you were born in this nation or, or, or um, behave naturalized in this, in this nation and then thinking about those who migrated and immigrated here. Um, I, I still go back to the origins of what Mark says. And, and I mean, like, what does it mean to be a, a citizen? What it, it means to be a human being? And we have not fully righted the wrongs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now of our Native American or indigenous um, youth, brothers and sisters in this country, I think of those of us who have contributed, the ancestors who've contributed to the foundation of this country. And we never established, we established some civil rights mm -hmm. and some forms of marginal inclusion. But in order to rectify and fundamentally recalibrate a system that we were built on, we never established education as a fundamental civil right. Mm -hmm. Right? We don't want to do we don't want to do reparations for the past. For some we have. In in mm -hmm. kind of shoddy ways, of course. Um, but I, I wanted to like think about this. What if we had what if we fundamentally try to establish education, a deep, rich, critical, engaging education as a civil right? Mm -hmm if we could be in a better place. And so I'm just gonna ask that question rhetorically because I don't know, I don't know if we can ever get there. And I think we keep putting reformist things on top of reformist things, but this system is so imperfect mm -hmm. that we would have to radically restructure it in ways to get to this radical form of inclusion where there's an expansive, no, expansive notion of citizenship and belonging, I think. Um, and that may, that's a big project. Yeah, it is indeed. Let's just switch gears and hear from you. Any comments and uh, questions we may have? We'll start here. Thank you so very much. Really a good start to the morning indeed. I just wanted to tie what you just said um, back into, I think, your first question about educational research and the theme of this conference, and also to <coughs> Have any comments or reflections on I, this? I have a brief one, and, and, and it just comes at the end of what you said, the notion of taking the work to the streets. Actually, we are in a place where we need to have the streets talk to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, 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 the most, for me, uh, obvious moment is, has been Black Lives Matter. They didn't need to, us to tell them what to do. We need to try to pay attention to what it is that young people uh, are saying and how they're saying it. And so I think there has to be a much more a, a level of reciprocity that has to occur for us to be able to do the work, not merely us thinking, well, we'll figure out how to translate our stuff, then we'll send it out there, then we'll do it with folks. No, I think we actually have to be in a place where we are in deep conversation with folks that allow a kind of of conversation that goes back and forth about what needs to be done 
-hmm. And what needs to be theorized? That's right. I saw a hand over here. Yes, please. In the back, yep. Well, I think it's really a marked question, and I'm like the last person who should be critiquing, <laughs> should be critiquing social media. I'm like so social media out there. Yeah. It's terrible. It's really I, terrible. I'll be there with you. I hit the like button I right know. there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I shouldn't really be critiquing it, but what I guess what I was speaking to was the way in which all voices are treated as equal because we've seen it as a way to be democratic, but I, I worry about what has become uh, anarchists in it, that there's just so many voices. How do you figure out what you're listening to, what, what is real, what is not real? Uh, you know, if you're going to have literally presidential policy via Twitter, that's kind of scary to me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I spend a lot of time in, in, the, in the social media world, and I spend a lot of time with young people. So I have a deep appreciation for it. I just can't figure out yet how do we um, have civic discourse in the midst of it, and Mark, maybe you have a... No, and I, I'm sort of, I just actually wrote a paper on this. We, we have a special issue, uh, we, we, uh, Kamika Royal and I edited a special issue on Black Lives Matter yes, for urban long education. Long That'll be out, I think, in a few months. And one of the papers, the paper I wrote was on, it's called Thank You Black Twitter, and it was talking about sort of the role of, of digital, what I call digital counterpublics and digital literacy counterpublics in thinking about these things. And I think there is that, Gloria raises a really important question, which is sort of at a moment where all news gets presented in one space, all information is presented in one space, it becomes, it, the need for critical media literacy gets heightened. Because the difference between a blog and a news post becomes very unclear. Um, the difference between real news and fake news is, you know, whatever, gets, becomes very diff, difficult to discern. But this is a generational challenge that happens with all new technologies, right? Um, in the 90s, it became, when Fox News came on, you know, Fox News was to news what, like, pro wrestling was to sports, right? It was in the vicinity <laughs> of that thing, it just wasn't exactly that thing, yeah. right? So at 8 o'clock, you watch Bill O'Reilly, and, you, and if you may think you're watching a news report. That, similar to Dan, you may have seen Dan Rather 30 years prior, but that wasn't what it was supposed to be. So it, it was a different genre with different, that required different interpretive skills and different understandings, different media literacies, right? Um, and so I think part of what we have to do is find ways to offer, and that's where we come in in terms of our interventions, critical media literacies and critiques of that. I think that will emerge as the technology develops because it's, we're beginning to figure that out. Your question, which I think is really interesting, is though how are we using this stuff to resist? How are we using it to organize? And I think BYP 100 is a great example of that. The, uh, in LA, a great example of that. Dream Defenders, great example of that. When we were on the streets in Ferguson getting tear gassed, it was children in Gaza that were saying, here's how you clean your eyes out. Here's how you make a makeshift gas mask, right? So there are these ways, that the concrete ways that, that digital media allows us to, 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 to hit. And because the smartphone technology has reached saturation with young folk. I think it's at 86% now among mm -hmm. young people between 18 and 25. They now have access to the internet in a different way. They have access to each other in a different way. And it is weird. And I talk to old school activists who are like, yeah, y'all can do flash mobs and y'all can meet up and y'all can connect and y'all can exchange information. But how do you know who's an agent? How do you know people are real? How do you know who's a troll? And I'm like, well, there's trolls in real life, right? It's, it's trolls in every faculty meeting I've ever been in, right? It's, you know, it's, there's, you know, we, we, we've never done a great job of rooting out the agents. I mean, COINTELPRO was rooted on, we were in the same room and we didn't know who the agent was, mm -hmm. right? And since the times of the, 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 the Socratic dialogues, there have been people who have been complaining about this new technology as a thing that's going to fragment us and break us down. I mean, think about Socrates, right? Talking about the book and, and how this technology is going to ruin our intellectual engagement, right? Mm -hmm. right? You can't even talk to the guy. I mean, these are, these are the critiques they're having. <laughs> so I think... I think it's true that it's troublesome, but I think new digital epistemologies will, will produce new understandings, new activism, new organizing, and new teaching. I think, though, to Gloria's point, that ain't going to come from us out. That's going to come from out, and we're going to have to learn from them how to do this thing, and it's going to take a minute. Yeah, but I, 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 go ahead. I, I just want to just add, and I agree, <clears throat> excuse me, but I think what we in the classroom can do, though, is to figure out how to socialize our youth mm. and parents and families of how to be respectful 
of the one another in that space. Yeah, I think yeah. that because the trolling can be minimized in some ways, the bullying can be can minimize in some ways if we figure out how to effectively socialize our children how to speak across lines of difference, and how to, to how to how to engage across lines of difference. Absolutely. I think that's where that's where the, the educators come in. Absolutely, right? we're approaching the end, so I'm going to ask you to be brief in your posting the questions. I see a hand in the back. <clears throat> So I don't think this is a new challenge. Yeah. In 1922, John Dewey wrote an essay called Education as Politics, mm. which starts off, we live in an era of bunk and hokum. And he goes on to say <laughs> that we are facing this propaganda regime that was brought about by World War I. And he calls out teachers for being complicit in creating people in broader society who are being gulled, he says. And so he, he talks about the need for teachers to be more courageous, which I think is right, but I think it's probably putting too much of the onus on teachers. We need to have ways in which there are broader systems of power that are supporting teachers as well. In terms of preparation, I would make two points. One is that it's critical that we engage teachers early on and then ongoing in their profession in sites where they can be involved in political activity, in civic discussion. If they're not practiced, they're not going to be responsive. They're not going to be comfortable. The other thing we need to think about is enabling teachers to see who their potential allies are and, the, and to see that democracy is a political and power process where they need to think about who will have their back when they make the claims that are needed in order to advance justice and democracy. We'll take one more question to go to closing comments. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's you. Yes. This is something that's very, very, very important to me as a university administrator now and trying to figure out how all of this is a system, right? And I think one of the most critical things is for us to also interrogate how higher education um, is complicit in the project. Um, and if we want to really get multi-discursive, multi-literate, inclusive projects to enable researchers practitioners to be able to do all the things that we're talking about, we have to open up the space of higher education and change some of its norms, right? So one of the things that I am highly aware of is that, and I hope that we can build bigger programs on how to build a new generation of young scholars who can actually straddle and cross these boundaries in terms of communication and translation of their findings and their, and their research. But then that has to be valued in the academy right. too, because people got their tenure. Yeah. And so the, the norms are not there. And mm -hmm. this is where higher education leaders have to engage in this conversation. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, and, and the tension is even here in the association, right? As we think about the spectrum of whose works matter and what prevails in terms of mainstream and positivism versus interpretivism and all these different kinds of binaries that exist, all of that stuff shapes what ends up being perceived as what matters. And then, unfortunately, we, we've, we've created a project where less than 5% of our work is actually received by those who make the decisions that affect the lives of our people, mm -hmm. right. of us. And so I think it's time for us in the university, those of us who run these universities, 
who engage across boundaries with philanthropists, um, who, who help to shape policy with legislatures and all those kinds of things, to think about changing our normatives, our norms about what we perceive as success for researchers and scholars. Because we have to be multiliterate, we have to be multidiscursive, we have to be multi methodological in many ways. I also think there is a space of hope. Yeah. And I think that the next generation of scholars, as I you know, have the privilege of working with them, are not in these narrow boxes. Right. I think Mark is a perfect example of someone whose career has been crafted beyond yeah. the academy. I think of folks like Chris Emden, Sammy Aline, Dawn Alyssa Fisher, uh, Elaine Richardson. These people are artists, they're uh, uh, scholars, they're activists. Um, you know, I think perhaps beginning with my generation of scholars, we first decided, you know, we're going to do something a little bit different. I think we owe homage to those who had gone before us because they had to figure out, I mean, Du Bois had to figure out how, how do you get a job, how do you keep a job. <laughs> yeah. He wasn't very good at it. Uh, <laughs> he was always losing jobs. But in some ways, it was this, his, that kind of pioneering spirit that, you know what, I'm going to strike out and try to do something a little bit different. Uh, I'm reminded of a, a, a statement that Joyce King once said to me, um, and she said, you know, the work we do is like pushing an elephant. An elephant has no inclination to move. And every day you just push it. Mm. And some days you get it to move a little bit and you go home and you feel really great about it and you, you know, you're, you're encouraged and you're hopeful. You come back the next day, it's come right back to where it was. But your job is still pushing the elephant. And I'll, and I'll wrap up by a favorite quote of mine by Derek Bell, who says, just because something is impossible doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Exactly. And, you know, but my own tra tradition, my own history is coming out of chattel slavery. That was impossible. Mm -hmm. But somebody decided it was worth fighting again. My own grandparents were sharecroppers. That, was, that system was impossible but somebody thought it was worth fighting against. My parents were in legal apartheid, state-sponsored segregation, which was impossible, but somebody fought against it. So the idea that we can help teach kids, if that's our task, it's not any harder <laughs> by a long shot than any of those things that have gone before, and I think we can do it. I wish we had another two hours, <laughs> but unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Thank you to, I want to thank our distinguished panelists and your involvement today. Uh, the conversation will continue. So uh, I hope you're having a great conference and join me in thanking the panel again.